Yo, what up, everybody? It's your boy, BQ, with your Impact Review here at the Impact Lounge. And I know I'm coming at you a little bit late this week. It is just that time of the month where I've got my Air Force Reserve weekend, or at least I had it this past weekend. And that always makes things really, really difficult for me to review um, at, a, at a decent time of the week. You know, so unfortunately, I'm knocking this out for you guys Tuesday. And uh, that's definitely not the way. Is it today's Tuesday or today Monday? I don't even freaking know, to be honest with you. It's the ninth. It's Tuesday. Yeah, that's the way the week has gone for me so far. So uh, knocking it now. If you join me here on the YouTube as opposed to the Patreon, uh, you're getting audio only this week. I do not feel good. You can probably hear it in my voice. I haven't felt good for the last several days. Um, I had to do some Patreon content. Excuse me, Patreon content. And, uh, you know, it didn't sound particularly good, but, I, you know, I had to apologize and doing the same to you. I think I sound a little bit better than I did the other day, but I'm just um, I'm just under the weather, but I still wanted to get this review out to you guys. You guys are just going to have to get it audio only. And of course, you're listening ad free on the Patreon. Also got some new com- content uh, coming your way there here very soon. Looking back at some of the pop TV stuff, Destination and Destination America. So we're going to talk impact here. Now, I lost my notes. I actually typed my notes out this episode, and for whatever reason, it just did not save on my computer, or maybe got closed out before I saved it. I don't know, but it's gone. So um, I'm just going to kind of, as I'm looking at the results, try to have to you know, try to uh, go by memory a little bit. But we're going to talk about this. This was the episode everyone was looking forward to because it was the the Trinity debut. And I kind of want to talk about um, before I kind of break the show down, just kind of give you an overall, just the, the way I felt about this episode overall. A lot of people liked it and I'm not going to say I disliked it. I don't, I don't believe that I, I don't feel that I disliked it, but it, it, there's some people who really like this episode that, that, that I don't necessarily agree with, but I thought it was okay. But I thought it was really safe. That was my big complaint about this. Very safe, uh, with the exception of Jonathan Gresham winning by tap out against Mike Bailey. Everything else, extremely safe. When I review this episode right now for you guys, keep in mind, I am delivering this from the standpoint of someone who is tuning into impact for the first time in a while. Okay. That is how I tried to analyze this episode. Not like I'm sitting here. We're all impact fans. Let's talk, talk impact. No Trinity was showing up on this episode. This was her big debut. It's what they had been teasing for a while. So there were people tuning in for this episode. I know for a fact who hadn't watched Impact in a while, or they only watch it every once in a while because they wanted to see what she did. They wanted to see this debut. Now, once upon a time, when Kenny Omega first showed up on an Impact, it was very similar. Obviously, they did much bigger numbers. That That was really, really big for them at the time. But the episode was horrible. And I don't put this episode in that in that ballpark, but it's close. And why do I say that? If you remember, I want to say maybe it was February. There was an episode of impact that I said, this is the worst episode they have done in years. And I hated every single thing about it. I started off saying, if you don't want to hear me be negative, turn off this podcast right now. This episode was very much like that. It was getting, again, I am speaking from the standpoint of someone who is turning on Impact for the first time in months. It's all the WWE job guys. It's bad comedy that you think Impact does, which they are bringing back this year. You know, last year they got away from it a little bit. It, it, to me, the episode came off as the exact reason people don't watch. And I'm comparing it to the Kenny Omega thing because I'm. it's almost like 
when the big moment comes and there's eyeballs, they don't deliver. And it was kind of the same with the total delete. Um, what was it called? I'm thinking the total nonstop deletion. The uh, the deletion or is that is that was that is that what it was called? No, I'm. Huh. I'm. The total deletion. I don't know what it was. <laughs> it was the first broken Hardy thing. It was the first uh, deletion with Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, and lots of people tune in for this because they did a great job of promoting and marketing that episode. And it was a decent episode, I remember. But again, it was just they didn't do anything to grab you. People tuned in for what they tuned in for and nothing else mattered to them. And this is what I felt like watching this episode. It was a, it was a little, you know, the, the, the aggression of Mike Bailey, you know what I'm saying? But for the most part, heavy reliance on the WWE mid carters that you have signed. It's almost like saying, okay, they're tuning in for Trinity. <clears throat> so instead of showing them the best of impact, we're going to give them familiar faces. So that's kind of how I, I felt. So again, did I necessarily dislike the episode? Probably not. But but I thought it was I thought it was just very safe. I did not think they put their best foot forward um, for the most part. So BTI happened. Uh, Laredo Kid versus Jack Price. I tuned into this because I wanted to hear Jade Chung do the ring announcing. When they announced that she was part of the team, I said, put her on the main show. I don't care what she sounds like. She's already the best ring announcer in the company. So I wanted to hear what, how she did. She did okay. Uh, this was not Christy Hemi. This wasn't, you know, the the girl that does uh, WWE. But she sounded okay. Uh, something you can work with. You know what I mean? Obviously, I'm not expecting her to be at her absolute best <laughs> the first time we hear her. But like when Penzer does, you can hear him fairly clear. And with her, you couldn't quite hear it. It's almost like very faint in the background. But it was such a breath of fresh air just hearing somebody else and, and a female. And I think she's going to do a good job. She's got a great speaking voice. Um, she's hot. You know, I think I think it's going to be a good addition. I heard, I've heard good things about her, you know, getting the audience pumped up and everything before episodes of Impact. Uh, but I I wouldn't be opposed to, I definitely wouldn't be opposed to her just doing Impact. Hopefully they're trying her out on BTI and they're going to move her up. Because, I mean, even watching this episode, and I say it every single week, I'm like, everyone gets the same introduction. It's it's very, uh, it, just, it, it just annoys me. I know it's starting to annoy some of my listeners. And maybe that's my fault. Maybe it's because I'm pointing that out to you. And there's some people who like think he's a legend and he should just r announce forever. But um, I really hope that she she works her way up. So the Rado kid got the win. Uh, I mean, who cares, right? This is just a, a BTI match. This starts off now. Remember, and, I, and I'm probably gonna have to remind you guys a couple times while I'm doing this. Standpoint of someone who's watching for the first time in a while. This kicks off. With Moose, who who we love, with Brian Myers, who we like, but he's a WWE jobber, versus our very own jobbers in Jabba Mora and Boopy. This was how they started the episode off. They could have started off with Gresham and Mike Bailey because there's some intrigue behind Gresham because he walked out on AEW. So I would have kicked the fucking show off with him. Not with... Jabba Mora and Boopy. And we knew they were going to lose. And they did. And I've got to ask this question. They have put out the under siege. Number one contender ship graphic for the world title. Why is Jabba Mora in this match? What has he done? 
to be able to insert himself in a number one contenders match for the world title. He has not won on our television. We don't know what his finishing move is. He didn't win this match. He didn't get pinned, but his team did not win. Why is he in the match? Brian Myers was on the team that did win. Put him in the fucking match. And um, I don't know, like the rest of the field is a very nice blend of like past, present, future, you know, except he stands out like dog balls. Why is he in this match? Is he talented? Yeah. Why is he in this match? Moose and Brian Myers win. This is not the way I would have started the episode because this is the way they started off the one episode that I said I hated. It was Brian Myers versus Dirty Dango in a number one contendership match for the world title. It was a qualifier match for the number one contender, I should say. But this match featured two people who win with the spear. One who wins with the clothesline and one who doesn't win. And then... um. Jim Miller is backstage with Steve Macklin, Champagne Singh, and Shira. I am coming around on Champagne Singh. I am coming around on this gimmick. Little phony, but I'm coming around. I'm starting to appreciate him as a performer. And I do think, you know, him and Jack Price by far have the best theme songs in the company. But. This also shows how shallow the Impact roster is because Steve Macklin needs some cronies. They added Singh and Shira, who who fit him not even a little bit. I can understand him wanting to hire a couple dudes. And I said last week, you know, I thought the security detail would have been awesome. He just always came down with a couple security dudes, and they could be indie guys, and they could... It, it kind of similar to when Sue Young used to wrestle sometimes and the bridesmaids were on her team. We didn't necessarily know who they were, but they wrestled as her tag team partners. Like, I feel like that could have really worked for this. But instead, we grab people from the roster. And there's a tag team match later. These three against PCO and two mystery partners. Hold on to your dicks. It's a letdown. Because it always is when there's mystery partners. Then, backstage, bad comedy with WWE mid-card acts. And it's Dirty Dango, who is not over with the WWE audience. There's, there is an audience for the uh, Fashion Police stuff. There is. But it's Dirty Dango talking about Santino and the whole, you know, who jumps Santino. Now, Santino is for the most part okay, right? He's, you know, our the prestigious Dr. Ross sent him home to rest, but he is not dead. He is not in the hospital. So this is probably a little bit much. And Trey Miguel's involved with this too in this particular skit. But I have to say, as much as I was like, okay, Dirty Dango, Santino, showing them WWE stuff, I thought this was fucking hilarious. Dango's bored in the back. And in my notes, I wrote everything down. Um, but, you know, like I said, I lost my notes. But the names he had up there in the pictures were freaking hilarious. I thought he was missing nails. That's the only person I would have put in there. But, I mean, he had Tyson Tomko on there and Mike Tanay, uh, like Prince Harry. I mean, or Prince William. I don't know the difference between those two. I mean, uh, Killer Kelly was in there. So I said, you know, what did it say? Something like uh, admitted killer. <laughs> so I'm glad that this segment went as long as it did because it gave us an opportunity to like appreciate what he did on the board. I wouldn't feature Trey Miguel into any comedy stuff, though. He's come a long way from the Rascals. I wouldn't feature him in this. 
Um, but I, I, I don't know. I thought it was funny. I, I really, truly did. But again, if I'm watching and I haven't seen the episode in a while and it's Dango, it's Santino, it, you know, we've already seen Brian Myers on the screen. Uh, I don't know. It, it's, it just has a bit of that TNA sting to it. Then Sammy Callahan um, accepts, accepts Diener's challenge to meet him in the ring. This is a story that we don't care about. Uh, we just really don't enjoy, but we'll see what the payoff ultimately is. And then we get um, Sammy Callahan, and he thinks he's going to wrestle Diener, but he ends up wrestling Khan. And again, another WWE mid-card jobber on the screen. And this match goes entirely too long. But with that being said, I don't want them to be afraid to put on in a longer match. I don't want them to be afraid to put, um, who's, a, who's another example? You know, Champagne Sink. I don't want them to be afraid to put these guys in, in, in longer matches. As a matter of fact, last week when uh, Singh and Shira wrestled, that match went, or might have been Singh by himself. Yeah, it was him. I don't remember. Um, it went on much longer than it probably needed to. It was at the match with PCO, but I don't want them to be afraid to, to put guys in a ring, you know? So I'm okay with them giving a chance, you know, giving that opportunity to con to, to wrestle and to do his thing. But I mean, again, this is just a, a faction that isn't over. The crowd didn't care. The majority of this episode, Um, this, the, the, the crowd was really praised as being really loud and rowdy and into it. And I didn't hear it. And I don't know if it was an audio thing because the very beginning of the episode sounded like shit. And I don't know. It, it improved as it went on. <clears throat> but it sounded like Tom Hannafin was doing voiceover work rather than calling from ringside. Um, but it sounded really, really bad. So I don't know if it was kind of audio issues, but I didn't feel like this was these people were engaged and crazy. The the majority of the people we saw on screen were sitting on their hands for the majority of the episode. It sounded like, or it looked like, the impact zone in Orlando. Now, I'm not going to say they were completely stone faced. I mean, they all were enjoying the show, but it was like it just wasn't what I expected when they were like, "Hey, we're broadcasting from Chicago. Um, crowd is crazy." It just wasn't what I expected. But again. We're seeing guys on the screen, Khan and, and Diener and, you know, acts that are not over. So what are they supposed to do? This is not a feud. <clears throat> I'm sorry I'm coughing. You guys know I'm not feeling well. This is not a feud anyone cares about. So they weren't really into it. Um, I got to say about Sammy Callahan real quick, and then we'll get to the finish of this match. He was doing a podcast interview recently, and he said he he recommended that young wrestlers look at Chris Jericho, and that that's been his the way he models his career because Chris Jericho reinvents himself every couple of years. I agree with that. Sammy Callahan is almost the same exact character as when he joined the company. I mean, there was like a ten percent change. It's pretty close to the same outfit. It's the same hat. If anything, he's just heavier. But he talks the same. He walks the same. There's been a couple times he's had some great theme songs and he changes them to shit ones. But he's not that much different than when he showed up. It's the thumbs up, thumbs thumbs down. So I just, I kind of got a kick out of that because he does not strike me as someone who's like, let me reinvent myself every couple of years. Now he's added the hacker and you know, he's, he's added some little wrinkles to it, but it's not that much different. You know, when he was injured and came back and he was doing the hacker thing, like it was not a far cry from who he was before he left. Even the backstage, you know, when he does the backstage videos, he was doing that stuff with OVE. You know, so I just I just found that kind of humorous because he's not really, really that much different. But anyway, this match goes on for a while and then a bunch of guys in yellow hoodies run out the army of violence. And they did this once before, and that's how they introduced Khan and and Diener. And I still stand by 
I think the design could use a female. I said the same thing about OBE. I think stables, when they add a chick to it, really um, freshens things up. Because these are three dudes that are boring the shit out of us. I mean, add a damn chick to the group. But he's jumped by the army of violence. Now, at Under Siege, there is going to be a match between the design and Sammy Callahan and two partners of his choice. This is going to be the payoff. If it is not Jay Chris and Madman Fulton, then they have failed us. They may get this match may get booed. Because nobody cares. But people are intrigued because we're like, well, we might get a reformation of OBE. Now, on this episode, later in the episode, he's he told Rich Swan, you owe me. He's trying to recruit Rich Swan. They had a really good story, uh, Slam Anniversary about four years ago. Now, if he has Rich Swan, that's fine. At that point, you have to add Jay Chris. You can't add Fulton because then that's not going to work. Fulton only works if he's with Jay Chris. No one cared about Fulton when he was with the company the first time. But if he comes with Jake, that'll be over. If it's Fulton and Swan, that will not be over. Jake is the one that needs to show up on this show because people always liked him. Heel, babyface, whatever it was. And I'm, I don't, yeah, he was a babyface only for a little bit when OVE first showed up. You have to have them in this. If it is two motherfuckers from the roster, if it is Tommy Dreamer, if it is Heath and Rhino, this match might get booed out of the building. But the Army of Violence thing was kind of interesting. We'll see. We'll, we'll see what, I mean, they probably just do very similar to Dark Order. They came in in the very beginning, jump people, and they didn't, you know, they weren't ultimately anybody from the roster. Um, Jimmy Jacobs. <laughs> this was definitely I've been I've been speculating about this. This was definitely done at Rebellion because he is in a a suit. I mean, he is suited and booted. He is looking good. He is not dressed like this to do an episode of Impact. He was clearly in his pay per view attire. But that's all good, you know. Um, again, it looks good. I hope. I wish all the interviews looked like this with the logo in the background. Um, is a breath of fresh air because it wasn't fucking red. And Nick Aldis, every time he gets on the screen, he makes that title mean something. He says something to make the title matter. Just the fact that he's saying it's not my intention. To just waltz in and jump in front of the line like <laughs> Trinity. He is he is saying, I, I will I will pay my dues. I will work my way up to the world title. You know, he knows he can't just step in here and challenge for it. So it's those little things he does that it just it makes it matter. It, it builds the anticipation because when he first showed up, I was like, dude, he's probably going to wrestle for the title under siege. I bet you Impact wanted him to. But that's not the way he rolls. That's not the way he operates. And he did some really good stuff in NWA, folks. When he was the man on that show, he did some excellent work. Um, And the company has really gone under without him. And then Kenny King steps on the screen. And this, yo, this is the perfect opponent for Nick Aldis right now. The perfect opponent. This is the perfect match to have. Now, we don't want to see Kenny King lose all the time. Clearly, he will when they have this. And they're also not doing the match next week because he's going to wrestle Sheldon Jean first. And we think that Sheldon Jean and Kenny King are going to team up. That's what we what we think where it's going. But this is a perfect guy because now we got two guys who can talk and they're, you know, um, it doesn't have to be about a championship. It's a match that, 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 has you know can have a little bit of a nice build, a little bit of a nice story, and it doesn't need a title. It, I'm looking forward to it. I am. I really thought Kenny King was a perfect person that they could have inserted in here. And Alicia Ass Pants Edwards versus Jody Redhair. And I don't know. I don't know what Jody Thread has yet that the that the company was like, yo, we need you. I'm not I'm not gonna say it's not there. We gotta see a little bit more of her. 
I got to see a little bit more of her. But I'm not seeing anything right now that that stands out. And I think it's because there's similarities to her, obviously her look, but her style and everything. It's just, there's a, we already have that in Impact, you know? She, uh, the match doesn't last terribly long. I thought Alicia looks pretty good in the heel role here, getting her offense in it. You know, obviously it wasn't a long match. Uh, And Jody, Jody Redhair hits the F416 for the win. Uh, We've seen it three times now. It has looked bad twice. You know, when Rosemary used to hit the Red Wedding, that thing was clean. We're not seeing that um, quite the same with Jody Threat. So hopefully we that uh, that looks a little bit better because it's one of the fresher finishers um, right now in the company. I appreciated that they didn't throw this match on, you know, um, the, the minute they had a little feud, they didn't wrestle the next week. You know, they, Alicia got a win. Jody Threat got a win. You know, that's, that's always what I'm asked for. Let, let the guys... And girls get a little momentum and then put them in the ring. It does nothing to to just, you know, to build a little mini feud and then just give it to us seven days later. I said the same with Boopy and Jabba Moore. Like, they should have wrestled last week and won. I don't know if it's because he's a young lion. He's not allowed to win. But Boopy's on his team. He could have, you know, speared some jabron and win the match. You know? But um, but I appreciated they both had a little momentum going into this. It was just, it was nice for me as a fan to see Alicia actually have kind of a feud, even though it didn't last too terribly long. And then um, Chris Saban's backstage with Gia, the Impact screensaver. Um, Chris Saban's going to challenge Trey Miguel for the X Division title at Under Siege. I mean, I feel like we've seen this fifty times, and we probably haven't. It might be a first time match for all I know, but. It just feels like every time the Motor City Machine Guns are inserted into something, I've seen it 50 times. I I don't know what it is, but I thought their promo, they they normally talk really well. I thought this was horrible. Um, Just trying to be funny, and it wasn't. It It was odd. It was odd for me, but for them, I just didn't find it to be very good. And, um... Alex Shelley says he wants to challenge for the world title. How many times is he going to wrestle for the title and not win? And then we get Gia again, sitting down with Frankie Kazarian. It's part two of the in-depth interview series, looking back at his impact career. And I said it last week, like, this is good. They need more of this. They're, they're acting like this is uh, going to be a thing going forward. I promise you it won't. I said last week they might interview Motor City Machine Guns once or twice, and then we're going to never hear anything of this segment again. I'm I'm almost positive in this. But, you know, it's a way of getting Frankie Kazarian on screen without having to insert him into some bad comedy skit backstage or to, for him to be a random run-in like he was for Tommy Dreamer. Like, this is perfect for him right now. Just gives him something to do without having to fucking wrestle or or... Again, like insert himself into something where he doesn't fit. So kudos to them for this. No kudos for this. It is Steve Macklin, Champagne Singh, and Shearer versus PCO and his mystery opponents. Hold on to your nutsacks. It is Heath and Rhino. Mid-Carter, WWE job guys on this show. I feel like this was done by design. Let's get all these people that they recognize instead of, uh, you know, the cream of the crop of the guys that we have in the roster who can like really fucking go. You know, Trey Miguel is not wrestling on this episode. He's doing some some comedy backstage. Um, you know, Rich Swan is not wrestling on this episode, which they know Rich Swan, but, you know, he wasn't in the company too terribly long. You know, but no, let's get Heath. Let's get Rhino. Uh, make sure make sure the gore happens. You know, it's just this this um this same old same old. So if Sing and Cher are going to continue to roll with Macklin, I hope they find a way to make them all fit a little bit better. Because the gimmicks don't there's they don't even a little bit. So um, you know, I'm not I'm not against it, but I'm going to beat that drum until someone listens to me. Security detail. As tag team partners, 
just like undead's bright undead bridesmaids it could work macklin seems to be in the middle of the show a lot of the time and i don't know if this was the top of the hour that might have been what it was you know i don't i don't watch the show as it as it airs it's very possible it was a top of the hour match so i can get that that's another important slot but i'm I'm worried that they're going to be afraid to go off the air with with Macklin. And I'm always I'm always talking about that. I'm afraid we're not going to see him in main events. We're going to, you know, they might be the quote unquote main event, but not the last match on the show. And, you know, I'm going to get into this part right now. He has a little run in with Scott Demore backstage. Why is Scott Demore? Oh, next week, uh, Rhino. Uh, uh. Why is he trying to make your his world champion look like a fucking goof on TV? And they do this with MJF, you know, Tony Tony Schiavone and AW. Listen here, you prick. Why are you trying to get the announcer over your world champion? Why are you trying to get Scott Nemore over um, in comparison to your world champion? This is your guy, face of the company, leading the charge. Why are you trying to get one over on him? Why are you trying to get over um, at his expense as well? Do you think uh, when Ric Flair was a world champion that, you know, whoever the authority figure was, Jack Tunney, I don't think he was the authority figure while Ric Flair was a champ, but did they come out and belittle him, try to make him look stupid? That's a weird thing about today's wrestling. Uh, Macklin should be the man in this company. Like so, like when EC3 was the world champion, like he was the man in the company. They weren't coming out, you know. Uh, when he was Dixie's nephew, so it's it's not like she's going to come out and try to screw him over. But they weren't, you know, there was not an authority figure to come out and and make him look half ass. They hitched the wagon to him. When he was the champion, it was his episode. They felt like his episodes. It felt like it was his show. And we don't get that with Steve Macklin right now. We need to feel like it's his show. It's the era of Steve Macklin as the world champion. And it just doesn't seem that's what they're doing. Instead, Scott Demore is punishing him with, with, uh, with Rhino. You know? We don't want to see Rhino wrestle for the world title. Why is he wrestling for the world title? He didn't. He wasn't even the person that won this match. He went after Macklin, and it was a. It's a ridiculous reason to put him together. Um, you know, because he went after him in the match on the outside. It was a ridiculous reason to put him together for a world title match. Thin roster. It's not to say you can't insert Rhino into a world title match. I mean, obviously you can, but. Why does he deserve to wrestle for the world championship? You don't have to defend the fucking title on everything. Make it a non-title match. Just have them wrestle. That's it. We know Rhino's not going to win the championship. So why even act like he's a contender? He hasn't won anything to deserve that spot. Hypothetically, Jabba Moore could win that six-way. Rhino could beat Steve Macklin, and they're going to be the main event of Slammiversary. Uh, the Heath hits the wake-up call. It's 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 playing the hits for the WWE audience. And then uh, we got the coming backstage, which you know I, I've been liking what they're doing. And Kylan King comes off as really television trained. I mean, she sounds great. She doesn't sound even a little bit fake. She's so so natural, and she adds a little bit of uh, the human factor to this this. Um, this silly gimmick. And then speaking of silly, it's Rosemary and it's Jessica and it's father James Mitchell. And it's the undead realm, bad comedy. And it wasn't even really comedy, just silly, phony, something that if you're turning in, tuning into this episode, you're going to say, what the fuck is this? I don't know why they're even doing this. We know Ty is gone. Write her off one episode and then move on. Find something interesting for them to do. We know they're not going to go find Taya. Unless they, you know, 
enter the undead realm and all of a sudden end up on dynamite, this is pointless. Jenna, Jonathan Gresham versus Mike Bailey four. Once you got to start using Roman numerals past three, you're probably doing a match too many times. Now they put out a special graphic for this. And I've been meaning to talk about this for weeks and I, and I just had not about doing alternate match graphics, especially with this company where everything looks exactly the same. They're finally doing it. Uh, you know, they got the idea from AEW, which is fine. I have no problem with, with co- copycatting little things that work, but you put out alternate match graphics and I mean, people, it gets people talking. It just does. You put that out instead of the, the stupid red graphic that they do. People are sharing it. They're retweeting it. They're saying that they like it. They're talking about it. They're making predictions on the match. It's a complete different reaction to the match. And that's the social media marketing that I, I've been talking about for so long. Those little things, those little creative things to create conversation. I will say I wasn't really into this match. Um, I don't know that the crowd was either. It just, it was a lot of really slow holds, rest holds, submission moves. It just, it was not very high paced. You know, at this point, after you've wrestled nine times, you would just think they're just kind of balls to the wall. And that's not where this went. So I just kind of didn't care because I'm, that's how I am as a wrestling fan in general. Like when I've seen a match too many times, I don't care anymore. Um, what I didn't expect though was Jonathan Gresham to win with the octopus and get Mike Bailey to tap. They have never had Mike Bailey lose clean and decisively on television. Never. Anytime he loses, it's the roll up. It's the goofy face. He has never just cleanly lost like, like decisively clean and decisive. That's never happened. I didn't expect this finish. I thought this was the cookie cutter. Mike Bailey gets the win now. I mean, speaking of cookie cutter, I'm fairly certain this is done to put them together as a tag team. Like next week, oh, I I respect you. Oh, I respect you. Let's go wrestle for the world titles next week. I I very much see them going this direction. So we'll see if uh, that's what they do. But I'm glad Gresham won. I think Gresham should be. I don't know if he's in that world title six way. I feel like he I feel like he is. And he, he absolutely should be. And guys like him should be wrestling for the world title. Not not Rhino. Not, you know. Well, I guess PCO. That's okay. And then it shows uh, the aforementioned one I was talking about earlier. Sammy Callahan trying to get uh, help from Rich Swan, And then um, backstage, which I also spoke about when Steve Macklin was, was talking to, uh, you know, Scott DeCuck. And he was, you know, trying to get himself over. Um, at the expense of his world t- champion. And then the moment everyone's been waiting for Trinity. She trademarked Trinity star. And I thought that's what her name was going to be, but she's just Trinity. She's not Trinity star, Trinity fat Two, Trinity infinity, uh, donate a couple of kidneys. It is just Trinity. So she makes her debut. And I mean, she really came off like a big star. And just in an episode where I didn't feel like the crowd really cared a whole lot. Um, and again, it very well could have been an audio issue. You could hear them here. Like they were into this. They were happy. She was there. She was emotional. And we don't get a lot of emotion on impact. Every, you know, a lot of things are very, um, very forced and uh, just unnatural. You know, just like even when you listen to the commentary, uh, whether it was Stryker and D'Lo and even the current group, everything's very scripted. We don't get a lot of like real, real raw emotion on the show. And you could tell that she was very emotional and she came out there. If she, if you know, if she was glowing red, I would have, I would have turned the TV off. Um, but she comes out and, um, you know, she cuts the promo and she sounds good. And I hadn't heard her speak on the mic in, in a while. And you can tell some of these WWE people who come over and they're, they're used to speaking to really large, large audiences because they're natural. They know how to go with the flow. Uh, they know how to react to what's going on and react to how the people respond to them. You know, so she really came off like a star. I thought the company came off a little desperate the way they were promoting this. Now you want to, I mean, obviously you want to act like she's a big deal. You know, I'm not saying to completely no sell it, but there were times it came off a little, 
especially on this episode when it started off and they're acting like it's one of the, the greatest days in the history of TNA. I see, I saw someone on Twitter comparing this to Kurt Angle. Now, unless Trinity sticks around long term, this debut means nothing. Now, as of just today, they say she's only signed through Slam Reversary and to do the, the tapings after Slam Reversary. Now, she very well could continue on, but we're in the same boat of the three month contracts that the fan base hates. And she's saying all the right things. I'm here for the knockouts title. I'm here because this is the best division division in the world. Well, then you would have stayed, you would have signed in long term if there wasn't other um a- another agenda. And who knows what that agenda is exactly? But I think that deflates things a little bit. I think it the air is out of the sail just a little bit because we know she's not going to be around that long. Um, and again, she very well could resign and oh, let's do another three months. Let's do six months. Let's do a year. She very well could. I just don't think she is. I think we're going to get a very short term. And that's why this isn't Kurt Angle. We're going to get the next Kurt Angle, the next Gail Quint Kim, when someone chooses impact, doesn't settle for impact, chooses impact and chooses to be there long term. You cannot compare someone to Kurt Angle or to Gail Kim if if that if that is not happening. If they're just there for a set of tapings or to do a couple of pay-per-views or brought in to go straight straight to the knockouts title like they're doing with her, then that's not gonna work. That is not Gail Kim. That is not Kurt Angle. That is not Sting. It's not these people who chose the company. And that's what they ultimately need. But it doesn't mean let's not get excited about this because this is fresh. Uh, Impact does a good job with letting people come in and be themselves. Um, it doesn't mean they always encourage it because we see it with the Dangos and, you know, where the Santinos, hey, come in and do what your shtick. But with Trinity, it looks like they're going to be like, hey, you know, she's going to have elements of her. Of, a, of her previous character, but it seems like they're like, hey, come in here, do your thing. Now we know Deanna and Jordan were probably coming out, and they did. And that was the first time this episode, you know, nor- the, normally I notice it right away, but this is the first time I was like, yo, this video quality, the, the uh, visual quality sucks. Again, they had the piss yellow filter on it. And, um, you know, Trinity is a tar- dark skinned girl. And I mean, there were camera angles where it just looked like clothes floating in air. Just this shit ass lighting. The hard camera lighting was was decent. And then they go, um, you know, to the alternative views and they, it looks like horse shit. And I think, you know, I get so frustrated with this stuff because there's no. You know, I, I've come a long way from how positive I was when I started this thing because five years later, I'm still doing this. Gosh, I think I've been doing it longer than five years, probably about seven years, but I'm still doing this. And there's things that there's no evidence they want to fix. I mean, am I wrong about that? There have been things that the fan base has begged for them to do something about. And there's no evidence that they care i mean they care they care about the fans but they care about what they care about they care about the names that they're signing the matches they put on and those are very important but when we're talking about for years how many people are like i can't hear the crowd how for how long years people have been complaining about how dark it is for years, not for months, weeks, day, years. I have been complaining about the freaking we on the night for years, three years to be exact. It took them forever to stop playing music in the background of all the interviews. They still play him in a lot of stuff. Um, like the, the Frankie Kazarian stuff like that doesn't need music. If you're going to throw some highlights, throw some music behind there, those portions. But then when he's talking, let him talk. Like, they're obsessed with that kind of stuff. We've asked for improved lighting. We've asked for 
you know, improve stage setup. They we've asked for the camera to not be on the entrance ramp and to be on the crowd, which they're starting to do a little bit. But these things were happening for years. And here you have this episode. You got this big star and you got people tuning in and you can't see her. Why? For what? Because I know from the people who are there live, it doesn't look like that. So what are they trying to achieve? How does this benefit the show for them to darken it like that? But I'm not kidding, man. There was times she was standing there. There were camera angles and she looked like clothes floating in the air with teeth. There's just no evidence that they want to fix these these little details that are going to make them stand out and look better and make people enjoy the shows more. But this um this whole segment though was was good. Um I thought they tied in some real life stuff into it in a way that they don't typically do. Like AEW likes to do that. Um uh, but Impact doesn't. I I just said it earlier, there's not a lot of realism to Impact. Everything everything's very very scripted. But, you know, Deanna brings in her leaving. Um, Trinity brings up Deanna being fired. I mean, this is like real life stuff. And that doesn't usually pop pop up in these promos at all. You know, so Trinity has an open contract for Under Siege. Uh, unless you're a champion, you shouldn't be open challenging. That's uh, That's how I feel. But whatever, it's an open contract. It's probably someone from the roster... Because they, these surprises, these silhouettes, they rarely pay off. I'm thinking it's it's likely Giselle Shaw. That's I'm because this is done in Canada, right? We haven't seen her on TV in a while. I'm I'm fairly certain Giselle Shaw is going to wrestle her. I, I would be shocked if it was anybody else. I, nothing else makes sense. You know, it's her first match, so she's got to win. Well, no, she's going to wrestle uh, Kylan King here pretty soon. Um, they're going to feed her one half of the knockouts uh, tag team champions. You know. Of course they are, right? Oh, um, but yeah, overall, I, I just I thought the episode was okay, but just very, very safe, very like, uh, let's try to appease the people tuning in who are fans of WWE. Uh, we got people that they know who are all fired for a reason. Um, but they're you know they got Heath and Rhino and Dango on the screen and they're the same characters that they were three years ago before they were let go before they left. You know, they didn't showcase the X division in this match. You know, uh, st- instead of Steve Macklin coming off like a badass, he was. You know, you have Scott DeCuck, uh talking down on him. Trying to make him like a, look like a fool, punishing him with a mattress as Rhino should be his freaking show. So you know the very I I really just thought the whole thing Trinity and the whole I thought she saved the episode <coughs> because if the episode would have just ended up with a re- regular main event, it would it would have been a complete bomb. Now I don't believe the viewership was very good for this episode. They went up against NBA fi- uh, NBA playoffs, not the finals. There's the competition right now. Uh, they didn't even release the viewership. They didn't release it last month either. So it's um, that's not a good thing. And this was a very heavily promoted episode. And it doesn't seem like a whole lot of people saw it. Which might be a good thing. Uh, maybe when she actually wrestles. When Trinity wrestles. Maybe uh, we'll get a good spike in viewership for that. But I thought this was a overall uh, down episode. When you're trying to wrote people in because they didn't do anything here that that makes someone say let me tune in next week there was no cliffhangers uh there wasn't even a cliffhanger with trinity she left she walked away and left uh, those two staring at each other so what is my motivation if i'm watching this show to, to tune in next week if i haven't seen it before like it's not already part of my routine to watch it what's my motivation We'll see, folks. We'll see. Uh, that's going to do it for me. Thanks for, for uh, checking out this audio-only version here on The Lounge. And um, I will talk to you guys again soon. Hopefully, I'm feeling much better here sooner than later. And uh, we'll talk some more impact. But for now, I'm your boy BQ, and I'm out. Peace.